interesting. Furman determined relentless in his unwillingness to give up. He was an engineer. President Jimmy Carter is a man of many talents. He is charismatic to those who know him well, attentive, clever, and innovative while at work, and above all, dogged and pertinacious in everything that he does. Former mayor of Atlanta, Andrew Young, put it best in saying, President Jimmy Carter was a citizen soldier. This could not be more true. From the time he took office, Carter made the pursuit of Mideast peace a key point in his foreign policy. He would go on to stress this point in holding the 1978 Camp David Summit, where he joined Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin and Egyptian President Anwar Sadat in hopes of bringing a conclusion to the decades of war between their two nations. His revolutionary negotiatory efforts at Camp David will forever go down in history. President Jimmy Carter, Engineering the Path to Peace. A critical breakthrough first came when President Sadat visited Israel for face-to-face -face talks with Prime Minister Begin. The world watched as President Sadat went before the Israeli parliament to deliver his plea for peace in the Middle East. Despite frustrations and even setbacks, the lines of communication were kept open through the White House, visited by Prime Minister Begin in December of 1977. That same month, President Carter met with President Sadat in Aswan, Egypt. These were among the first steps taken in the extensive peace process. The summit itself was to be the climax of this process, as Carter realized that to truly mediate peace, Begin and Sadat would have to be brought together in a unified front. Throughout those tremulous 13 days in September, President Carter would work meticulously and tirelessly to answer Sadat's plea for peace in the Middle East. He would make many a historic moment for the nations of Egypt and Israel, as well as the United States. Negotiations began September 5, 1978. President Carter greeted President Sadat and Prime Minister Begin with hopeful eyes, perhaps initially underestimating the trying task at hand. The three men sat together and began to address the issues of the Sinai territorial conflict as well as that of the Palestinian people. Carter found early on that the decision makers, the faces of those two nations so riddled with war, could not see eye to eye in their own personal distaste for one another. The chemistry between Sadat and Begin, it turned out, was terrible. The two men could not talk to each other. Begin and Sadat were two men so different, it was a miracle that they found themselves on the same grounds beside President Carter. Yet there they were, and they could hardly coexist, much less civilly discuss the issues at hand. Thus, the negotiation process proved much more difficult than anyone could have predicted. Carter, realizing the newfound difficulty, took responsibility, becoming key negotiator between the two. My right eye will fall out, my left hand will fall off, before I agree to the dismantling of a Jewish settlement. The effort of our generation is to return to the 1967 borders. Afterwards, the next generation will carry the responsibility. Two men, two nations, two opposing ideals. One goal, peace. Begin, a stubborn man, rigid and unagreeable to many. Sadat, a friend of the President of the United States. The former sought to keep Israeli settlements in a land not rightfully Israeli, confiscated during the Six-Day War, and refusing to allow the Palestinian people a right of return to their homes in what was formerly British Palestine, modern-day Israel. The former sought control of a land rightfully Egyptian, the Sinai Peninsula, an estate for the Palestinian people, then refugees, neither wishing to compromise, both willing to negotiate at the hands of President Carter. And so it fell into those very hands to do something never done before, to accomplish Mideast peace with a new style of negotiations. The Camp David Conference should be renamed. It was the Jimmy Carter Conference. For Begin, giving up Sinai was not such a huge decision. What he was trying to be sure of is that he wouldn't have to make major concessions on the Palestinian issue. But if he had been forced uh, to confront those issues and had finally said no, he would have gone home and most of his supporters would have agreed with him. He was probably in the strongest position to accept the failure of Camp David. Carter, on the other hand, could not afford to fail. He worked diligently on process papers for the framework agreement, analyzing every sentence, every word, perhaps even more so to sway Israeli Prime Minister Begin and Egyptian President Sadat quite cleverly appealing to their values. The president spent the afternoon drafting his own wording for the Sinai Agreement. Perhaps word of this has gotten to the Israelis somehow. 
because Begin has requested a private meeting with the president tonight, which he has in advance described as the most important and difficult meeting of his life. In this meeting, President Carter successfully ensured that the tough-minded Egyptian Prime Minister would remain at Camp David. He accepted that Prime Minister Begin did not take too kindly to President Sadat and that some notions proposed by the Egyptians and the Americans alike would not be agreeable to the Israelis. Nevertheless, he pleaded with Begin, saying, We will work not only to attain peace, but to maintain peace recognizing that it is a permanent challenge of our times. For if nothing else, the one thing that Carter and Begin both knew so well was the wish to leave this world greater for the future generations, for their grandchildren. This, Begin could not deny. Sadat, too, had his doubts as to the success of the Camp David summit. He, though normally level-headed and assertive, was removed and prepared to leave Camp David. My bags are packed, and we have called for a helicopter to take us to the airport in Washington. Does President Carter know this? Yes. He asked to meet with me privately, but I see no reason to. Anwar, you gave President Carter your word that you would do everything you could to bring peace. Now you are walking out. He is a man of morals and principles, and you are too. You cannot do that to him. I explained to him that his action would harm the relationship between Egypt and the United States. He would be violating his personal promise to me, and the onus for failure would be on him. A former soldier in the Egyptian army, President Sadat was compelled by the idea of morality and living an honorable life. Thus, this was Carter's final appeal to him, for how could a man that so valued honor break a promise to another? Sadat was drawn not only by the appeal of President Carter's own morality, but by the fear of dishonoring himself and his name that he had worked so hard to accomplish. In addition to his methods of persuasion, President Carter was very hands-on in the drafting process. The president is driving himself mercilessly, spending most of his time either debating with the Egyptians or the Israelis, or drafting and revising texts that are being submitted to him. He has single-handedly written the proposed document for the Sinai formula. So he was much more engaged than probably any previous president in the actual negotiations and the drafting and so forth. He was a stubborn man. He didn't want to give up. At one point, uh, the Israeli defense minister passed me a note. It said something like, your president's amazing. He knows as much about these issues by now as we do. And it's our problem that he knows more than we, we do. And he's not going to give up. He's not going to allow us to fail. And the president worked. As far as my historic experience is concerned, I think that he worked harder than our forefathers did in Egypt building the pyramids. We are privileged to witness tonight a significant achievement in the cause of peace. An achievement none thought possible a year ago, or even a month ago. And a true achievement it was. It was at Camp David that President Carter laid the base of the framework for many future negotiations. At Camp David, Carter was a friend, a president, a mediator, and the glue that kept all together. And like any president before him, he worked not only on a personal level with President Sadat and Prime Minister Begin, but professionally in expanding American foreign policy toward the Middle East, and also in the writing of diplomatic agreements, striving to bring peace. And he did just that, nearly single-handedly forging peace between the nations of Egypt and Israel, resulting in the 1979 Egypt-Israel Peace Treaty. This treaty among the only lasting binds of peace in the Middle East, an example for all other nations who share the desire for a world in unity. And despite the fact that the framework for peace in the Middle East, fashioned at Camp David, did not ameliorate the issue of the Palestinian people as evident by the 6.5 million remaining Palestinian refugees, it was on those sacred grounds that President Carter achieved the first everlasting peace agreement in the Arab-Israeli conflict, setting the stage for many to come. Today, Carter, now 90, stays faithful to his promise in continuing peace efforts around the world. President Carter never lost sight of the urgency of the search for peace in the Middle East. The Camp David summit was to become a key chapter in that story. President Jimmy Carter's commitment at Camp David will never be forgotten.